that the last talk of, of the summer tonight with, uh, with Eric, uh, the last guest we have. So Eric with, was with um, attorneys all the day to look at what um, the attorneys of Thai Paris have, have been doing since five weeks. So it was about pushing the serif on the left, changing uh, the top of the, of the G and making the loops more funny or fixing interpolation, no? Not, it's not, it's not, they are not funny at all, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, w I will not invite you. <laughs> um, the first time I have read about uh, letter error was right after ATP Oxford 90 organized by Roger Black at Oxford in, in, in UK. At the time, this young guy together with Just Van Rossum hacked type three or type one font format, which format it, uh, is the three? The, yeah, the three. Uh, to create a random font called uh, Beowulf. Then, um, three years later, we meet at the first type lab inside ATP in uh, Antwerp in 1993. Um, together, they were involved in to the organization of that of what will change deeply the typical type conference as we know today. A bunch of computers connected to each other. It's before the internet. Uh, all of us designing fonts in one day, from Jonathan Hoffler to Lucas De Groot, Martin Mayer, Fritz, Fritz Mayer, and many others. All discussing about new technology, organizing short presentation. And thanks for to Eric to doing that, but also Eric Spikerman and also your brother, yeah. Um, Eric was not the typical typeface designer following the strict formal tradition. He wasn't either into a, into grunge typography, the thing from the 90s, yeah. He was already into something unique, an attitude who push all the community to think about how we have to work with technology or we have to be independent, or to keep our critical sense in the same time as embracing new technology, or to use technology without losing lost to our human soul. Every typeface he designed was a mix of a traditional savoir-faire with a flair, as well inventing tools to design them, to produce them. I recall particularly of Cosmic in 93, a sort of non-polished script face who randomly display different versions of the same glyph. This project was incredible in the sense that Eric questioned legibility using different shapes in quite subtle way. The effect to the eye was incredible. The flip version was more legible than the standard version on all the imperfect typeface are on incredible books in the 15th century. I recall also of this crazy project that he made for Minneapolis uh, Twin Cities, a typeface who changed its shape from external factors such external temperature and many other things. <coughs> I can continue <coughs> I can continue for hours about Eric design and coding, teaching, but let Wex wait for his talk. <coughs> a last thing. I want to say something on behalf of the type community using my ATP honorary president ad for this thing. Eric built with some friends the UFO form open format that we use every day, as well as the WOOF font format, who changed radically how the web font works today, as well as web font license. So thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for what you have done for us, all of us. Thank you to accept to come to Paris this year mean a lot for me and, um, and it mean a lot for what we try to build since 2015. You're welcome in Paris, Eric. <laughs> Let's, let's see. Uh, so I need to hold a microphone, and um, I, d I don't do stage things very well, so I might look a little bit, because if I did, I would not, be, not, not, would not have become a type designer. 
Also, it is very warm, and uh, thank you for, for your patience. And if I mumble or waffle or stand here too long, just please uh, uh, tell me to, um, to stop. Uh, so, um, letterer.com, letterer, uh, it means, uh, obviously, it means terror and letters and errors. And uh, when I made up this name uh, together with my, uh, my friend and colleague, Justin Rossum, it was very funny. And we made a dom domain for it, and since then, I've, I've had the honor of having to explain it every single time. And um, I also um, work uh, at the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. Uh, I um, am part of the Type of Media uh, course, the master course uh, that you may have heard of. Um, I'm going to show some of, the, some of these slides. Um, and I really mean it. I have, I have 94 slides, but it's so warm. I always prepare the wrong, the wrong presentation. Uh, but some of it moves, I suppose. All right. Uh, Jean-Francois, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for pointing out that all of my great uh, achievements are already 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a bit of a relief. It just means that I, I, can, uh, I, don't, I don't actually have to achieve anything. Uh, my, my career is done. It's sort of like downhill. It's, but it's fine. So uh, this is the, uh, the thing I did with, uh, with Justin Rossum uh, early 19, I think the summer of 1989. So that, that actually makes it 30. I mean, it's, it's this summer. We should have a party. Um, Beowulf. Um, we found out that we were, Just and I were both into coding. We found out that um, uh, in PostScript, the letters are expressed as numbers, but also as instructions. And we could we'd go into the code, we could figure it, stuff out, we could make it make it work. Um, so every time this typeface would print, it would um, come out differently. And if you put that in RGB and superimpose the colors, uh, it does it does funny animated things. And basically, very early on, this showed that um, design, aesthetics, and code are so closely woven into get into each other that uh, you have to know code, you have to know design, and, and all of this stuff works together. And uh, I think most, most of the things that we've done together and most of the things we've done separately since, uh, that's a, 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 a theme that comes back. Uh, unless uh, when I drew money that appears on the American uh, currency and then somebody else puts it on a race car. And this is just 20 different ways of cool. Uh, I don't know if the car still exists, but no. how often does this happen? Um, my goal with this was um, the, the copyright situation of type design in, uh, in the United States is, is rather dire. There's no copyright on, on shapes. I thought if I draw the letters that are on the currency um, and I get a response from the US government saying you cannot do this, that would be an official admission that there is such a thing as copyright on type and I would be happy to, uh, to subtract, to take the typeface back. Um, they haven't done this, uh, so I'm still selling it. But. Um, just a couple of whole things. Here's a thing uh, I did with House Industries, uh, also 10 years ago. Uh, Eames, uh, Eames Century Modern, lots of typefaces. Uh, basically a typographic fiction. Uh, the, uh, Ray and Charles Eames did not design type, um, but we pretended they did, and then we sort of invented these, these things. Uh, working together with House is always interesting because they're, they're fantastic designers. And that's a long time ago. Uh, this is the most recent thing, action condensed. This is me trying to draw uh, a boring, neutral, condensed sense. And then um, um, commercial type saying it actually is very peculiar and specific and uh, shows how much fun I'm having. Uh, so even when I'm trying to draw serious type, it doesn't work. Uh, this one actually had a couple of interactive uh, layers and, and uh, stuff going on. So that's it for the work. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. Um, my second, my second subject uh, is, uh, is type of media. Uh, some, some notes about this. Um, and because, why? Is because it is, it is really interesting. Um, we have, just as here, uh, people coming from all over the world who are interested in type design. And uh, they don't spend five weeks, uh, they spend actually a whole year. Uh, but they come to The Hague and then uh, we teach them how to draw and be curious and, and have lots of fun. Uh, and in return, they do uh, work scientific research uh, with a ruler. And uh, <laughs> as we were trying to do visu visibility things, and uh, we also use, anyway. Um, to study type design, I think in this day and age, uh, is interesting. So the digital tools are very much available. Uh, it doesn't cost much to get a license. I it doesn't cost much to, uh, to see all sorts of interviews and videos and read books. There's I think you know, to be a type designer, uh, to publish type, and to be a student in type design, uh, today is, is maybe the best days uh, it's ever been. Uh, there are so many people that have access to this information. Um, and there are so many people who are interested and, and do goofy things. Uh, recently, actually, um, uh, 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 yesterday, 
uh, the, uh, the class of 2019 graduated, so at four o'clock uh, we handed out diplomas, and uh, uh, at six o'clock I was in a train to Paris. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was fun. Um, if you're interested, very brief moment of, of advertising. Uh, we have an annual open day. This is the KBK, the Royal Academy of Art Open Day. Uh, usually every last Saturday of January. So I think if my calendar is correct, that's gonna be January 25, 2020. Uh, look at topmedia.org and kbk.nl if you wanna find out or send me an email. Um, the Open Day the Academy is always a lot of fun. Uh, all of the departments are showing their stuff, graphic design, fine arts, uh, interiors, all sorts of masters. Um, and if you can stand the weather in The Hague in January, uh, you're, you're probably good for the rest of the year as well. So I think those are the required things I wanted to say. Um, I, I, do add, I did add uh, a couple of subjects that, that were more about um, type design and sort of maybe uh, slightly detailed things about type design. If this is not your thing, don't worry, it'll be over soon. Um, if it is your thing, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you have some questions about this. But so one thing I think it really interests is really interesting about type design is scale uh, and how size um, size matters. So in in the current typographic world, um, size is not the same as distance, and it's not the same as resolution, and it's not the same as the application you're looking at. Uh, scale relates to all of them. They affect the type, the way that we interact with type, the way that we see it, the way that our eyes work with it, the way that we use it in topography, uh, and the process of reading. Uh, just for very stupid basic facts, the largest point size you can use in Keynote, anybody? A thousand points. Because some engineer at Apple thought, a thousand, that's a big number, surely nobody's gonna make it bigger. Uh, so a thousand point, this is a thousand point typeface. Um, <laughs> this is the biggest you can make in Keynote. Uh, I think InDesign actually wins. I think they, w they go to 1,296 uh, points, uh, but uh, that's it. I mean, why, why is that a thing? Anyway, so it says poster. Uh, we know books, and we know, we know, what does it say? Card. These are traditional uh, uh, 19th, 20th century terms about size. So we would have a very big poster and we have a slightly smaller book thing and you would have a cart that's a smaller thing. And these, these terms have a meaning uh, for, for scale. We know posters are big and books are small. Um, today, these days, actually it translates into we have a desktop thing and we have a phone thing and we have a watch thing. Uh, a desktop being the biggest screen we look at because we don't have this at the studio or at home, or at least no, I don't. Um, my house looks like this. Uh, uh, there's, there's a screen sort of a kid size and there's a computer somewhere nearby and there's an iPad on your lap and there's a phone in your hand and there's a watch on your, on your wrist. All of these screens, all of these screens use the same data. It's showing the same file, it's showing the same fonts. Uh, but it's not the same reading experience. The TV might be three meters away, the, 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 the iPad is maybe on your couch here, your phone is here, uh, 30 centimeters. Your, your watch is maybe even closer because it's too small. And by the time you can afford one, you can no longer look at it. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny Ive. It's all the same data. Um, and this means that you know, in the, th the thing that you design has to be somehow scalable and respond to the shape. The thing that you, the typefaces have to respond to the size. And this is a, a bit of research we did for HBO when we worked on a, a, a big custom uh, typeface for them uh, together with uh, Kai Bernal uh, and Susanna Cavallo is that even the pixel size of the typeface doesn't mean anything. Uh, uh, the angular size, how close the typeface is to you, the resolution it's rendered at, uh, there's no way it can, o it, it can work. You really need to make typefaces for the specific environment. This sounds like marketing points, like we're selling some fancy product, but um, as a typographic problem, it is, it is real and it is, it is really complex. Uh, you can make you know, a, a, a pixel image that big and put it on a watch. You can make the same pixel image might actually go on the side of a building. They have the same resolution, but the reading experience is totally different. And how do you design for that? First, you make something out of, out of uh, uh, SVG and it scales and it, and it works, but I think the shapes need to be different as well. Um, very good question. Have I done any significant work to find out how to handle all of these? Uh, uh, no, of course not. Uh, I, I usually tend to go into the code and into theoretical approaches of it and then try to turn it into assignments and, and involve my students. Uh, so there's some student work. Um, 
But you know, I was I was really proud and happy to see uh, Bart Vollebrecht's work for for Studio Dunbar. Like those moving moving letters, he was one of our students, and he was doing amazing work then. Uh, and it's so nice to see that how this integrates into you know, a critical and and experimental environment as Dunbar, uh, where that stuff is really looked at and 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 really figuring out what what is the best way to use this. Clearly, I know that this is not for type designers to do. We cannot fix scale issues with hinting. We cannot fix scale issues with better screens. We cannot fix scale issues with media queries. It affects spacing, glyph geometry, uh, uh, perceived contracts, large things far away, small things, large things close up, small things far away, small things close up. I started doing the math. I started scaling images. Uh, I started figuring out how it works. And oh boy, did I discover stuff. So a headline, a text, and a caption. Can I actually see what that, no. The stuff is not the, s the, r the right size. You can have captions that are huge, and you can have text things that are very close by. I started experimenting with uh, uh, taking the same text and making it bigger and smaller and trying to figure out, can I, is the reading experience, I, I put them in places where they would be the same size optically, close by and further away. Uh, is that the same reading experience? If I'm looking at a page at this size, is that the same reading experience? Are my eyes doing the same thing? If I take that size and put it up on the wall? No, because my head moves in a different way. The muscles move in a different way. There's also funny stuff that, that topographers know nothing about. Uh, doctors know nothing about. Uh, uh, glasses people will just sell you things that focus, but they don't really do anything. So I think there's, if you're doing stuff with VR, um, there's some, some interesting legibility and readability research uh, just, just up for the picking. You know, Jock and Margaret Calvert's work, uh, we look at the stuff that's close up, but it's really, it's meant for this and, and this in the middle. Um, Adrian Vroetiger in a design by Paul Maxenaar, Schiphol, Amsterdam Airport. Uh, also, you know, we've done some optical corrections for it. We've done some stuff for the, for the bitmaps, for the screens a long time ago, certainly not what you're seeing now. But uh, these, these things are interesting. The, the stuff is this close up when you're looking at the screen and it's, it's like a meter and a half tall when it's, when it's far away. Does it have to be the same typeface? Can it be the same typeface? So one of the rabbit holes I dug myself into uh, was um, I thought, oh, well, but what, what about light? How does light work? Oh boy. Sometimes light reflects off the page and the letters absorb and the white page reflects and it goes through the air and our glasses and our cornea and the soup and all of these things. Uh, screen works a different way. There's a lamp and there's a bit that obscures it and then it reflects and, and uh, only the light bits that come to you. This process of reading, um, we talked about this earlier, it's like it, it, evolved, it evolved very, very slowly. Our eyes as they are now are behaving the same way as I think humans were, if I understand correctly, 100,000 years ago. So the motions our eyes are making, the orientation of our eyes, the way that the lenses work, all of that stuff had a different purpose. It was scanning the horizon for people we'd like to meet or things we would like to eat or things we need to run away from or whatever. But that's what our eyes and uh, the, 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 physical, the physical bits of in our, our head were made for. And we love looking at contrast. There's shadow, there's dark, there's bright, and these shapes begin to get meaning. Uh, these shapes begin to uh, look at letters, and there's letters in a pool, and there's horizontal things. The motion that our eyes make when we look at these shapes, I think, is, is stuff that we started doing, and reading developed out of that. If you know how to read a shadow, you can actually understand what was where where the light was coming from, what kind of light it was, who was standing there, what you're holding, was the light reflecting? I've seen, I've seen actual science where they reconstructed images just by reflections on the wall, and they can kind of sort of look around the corner just by, by the reconstructing the shadow. Anyway, I love li light and dark uh, projections. So understanding some of this light uh, gave me uh, a direction for, for more research that never really went into any project. But so we have scale, we have light, and now we can look at this thing that we call optical. 
Type designers love the word optical because it sounds like you know something and you know what you're talking about. What does this mean, optical? What is an optical correction? I, I would argue that an optical correction is anything you can see. If I can see the correction, I, I know what it is and I can fix it. If I see a problem and I fix it, it's, it, it's definitely optical <laughs> because it's not a braille. Um, but there's a couple of you know, things that are, are, are pushed together. You see this, oh, this is optical, optical corrected, uh, four and a quarter point, four D dough, uh, set of five and a half. And you look at this, oh yes, yes, this is optical. Yes, this G is optical and this J is optical and the, the Y definitely is doing all sorts of optical. What does that mean? It means that Monotype, when they were making this, uh, wanted to make gill and they wanted to fit uh, uh, the whole letter on a four and a quarter point. That's tiny, that's like this, this much, it doesn't fit. It's the tiniest, tiniest thing that they have. And then what did they do? They said, oh well, no, let's fit, let's fit this, the ascender down to the baseline on that four and a quarter point. And uh, there are not that many letters with, uh, with descenders. So there's a P, and there's a J, so just out of luck. I just you know, knock them up and uh, there's sort of a G that fits in the X height. There's nothing optical about that. They just make a five point type fit on a four point thing by taking off the descenders. For digital type, this is not necessary. We don't need to do this. Uh, we can make four point type with all the descenders and everything will fit. It's digital, we have that room. But making things work, making things readable at four point is a totally different matter. And how do you design for that? Well, you study eyes. Um, if this is bothering you, I, I, d I don't have the more gruesome ones, but this is, you know, uh, uh, we have two, uh, if they work fine, that's great. Um, actually, I don't, have, I don't have all of the scientific slides and you're so lucky. The, th the, the basic thing is that light comes in and it touches your cornea and our eyes are not so good. It's basically just translucent ham. There's, it's not so fantastic. We think now the eye is the most fantastic object we have and definitely if you break it, you're out of luck because bloody hell. And also you know, get glasses and make sure and take care of them and don't rub your eyes and wash your hands and all of that stuff. But the biological matter of the cornea and then the biological matter of the lens, it's just, it's just fibers and the light just bounces through that like fibers do. And uh, the thing that actually ends up on your retina is no longer a single point. It's kind of sort of this blurry blob. I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, here's a, a slide from an actual PhD doctor. Um, that shows now 2020 vision, which is uh, sort of the smallest that you would see by, by using American standards, and in 2040, this is twice as big. On the left, you would see the letter that is then projected, and on the right, you don't even see it, is the blurry, fuzzy thing that actually ends up on your retina. This is how your cornea and your lens deal with it, and then that blurry thing is, is what your photoreceptors have to work with. Um, I was not very happy when I saw that. Of course, on the other hand, we have, uh, we have sort of comforting things like this. Uh, this is optical scale in typefounding. Uh, a fantastic article by Harry Carter, uh, Matthew's, Matthew Carter's father uh, from 1937, uh, in which he write, writes, the whole problem of adapting type design to optical susceptibilities is a fascinating and very difficult one. It is only possible to nibble at it without having proper experimental apparatus and ample time. He also says that maybe with this new thing of, uh, of hot metal typecasting, we can actually make optical sizes because it's so much cheaper and faster. Of course, nobody does. Uh, but uh, the example here is, um, I see it's a six point and 10 point hand cut by uh, uh, Justus Erich Walbaum. Uh, the relatively low join in the N and bolder serifs in a smaller size are good features. So we can take this, we can look at this and accept it as face value and saying, oh yes, uh, when we make the type smaller, the contrast needs to go down. The, thing, the, the, the things need to be a little bit thicker. Did you, do you think that Justus Erich Walbaum was thinking that he needed to make the thins thicker? No, he was cutting the thinnest lines he could in the 10 point and he was also cutting the, thin, the thinnest lines he could cut in the six point. He was not thinking about changing the contrast. He could, he could not do anything else. He was cutting uh, the best that he saw. Um, also amazing to see that uh, they're kind of wobbly and, and, and messy and apparently if you make this at six point it doesn't matter, which I think is also very comforting. There is a false precision. Uh, we sit in our, our beautiful retina screens and fantastic software. We zoom in to 8,000% uh, 
and we have the crispest, most, most gorgeous, sharpest laser printers and screens around us. And you look at details this big and you look at details that, that small, but it's always at arm's length. The screens are always here. We never put the screen at the other way, at the other side of the room. We never put it, uh, uh, print it out on a poster, put it on the other side of the street and walk back 100 meters. The optical experience is different. Your eyes work different. Your lenses are different if you look at something far away. Also scary stuff. I didn't know, and now I know, and now you know. And, and does it make you happy? Um, these were 600,000 of my best friends. Uh, they're well-trained white dots. And it, each dot uh, um, now animates between the place where it starts and then the place where, where this diffraction, this thing that happens in your eyes, ends up. And then the, the, the diameter of this fraction uh, increases a little bit. So we have a, a very fat A on the left, uh, a sort of a text size N in the middle, and a very thin uh, E on the right. And when this diameter gets bigger, it's basically the type getting smaller and smaller or yourself removing yourself. So uh, this is what happens when type gets smaller. You can tell in the N, there's, there's more bleed happening in, in the serres. Like these serres are gone and that, that connection there is gone. You can still see the stems because this stuff is bleeding in there. But the, the bleeding lowercase e, it's too thin, it's already gone. So if you wonder why you cannot see a thin, uh, a high contrast, scripty italic at six point. This is why the light falls around it. Your eyes are just making that thing disappear. Of course, like the, the fat A is still there and the strokes of the M are still there. This is what the light does. I'm not making any of this up. Of course, I mean, it's a, it's a robot animation. I did not um, um, catch photons in the air when I was looking at this, but uh, this I'm actually using the numbers from Mr. Aurora Science, and as far as I can tell, I'm doing the right thing. Uh, here's here's the same the same process, but then um, using bars. So at the top, this little disc is uh, 50 units diameter, and it gets a little bit bigger, and it gets more fuzzy, more fuzzy. It's the same number of dots. So we have a big black line and a thin black line. Of course, we're not seeing black. There's no black. We're only seeing light. So the only thing that you see is the light hitting your retina and doing the diffraction thing. And the fact that you think, oh, I'm looking at a black line, this is because there's a bit of a bit of space in front of you that doesn't uh, uh, doesn't fill with light, but the light scatters out. So the white gets bigger, it bleeds in here, bleeds in here. When I increase the diameter, when it gets to this point, I'm sorry, I've worked out of the camera, but so the, the big bar is still visible and it remains visible for a while, but the thin bar has disappeared. So the thin bar gets thinner. The diffraction will make the thins go thinner. So if you reduce type, uh, the thins will look thinner. So if you reduce type and you want, to, you want to prepare type for being in a small size, you need to make the thins thicker because you're countering this effect. You're not just doing a trick. You're not just moving points around hoping that you're doing an optical thing and nobody will call you out on it. Um, you're actually countering a thing that is happening in your eyes. So by understanding that, I think, I really hope that you know, somehow I can make better type and maybe, maybe you can figure this out as well. So if you design for screen, you, you draw on screen and you proof on screen. If you design for phones, proof on phones. If you design for, for wall panels, proof on wall panels. Make your eyes do that thing. There's nothing intellectual. You cannot understand what happens. You can explain it to you rationally, but to actually experience something being small or something being huge in front of you is a totally different thing. So here's my wisdom for tonight. Always prove at actual size, whatever that is. Did you prove the really big ship letters at the right size? Yeah, I never proved it. Uh, fantastic. If you don't know what the actual size is, find out and go for the biggest and go for the smallest. Uh, sometimes uh, also take your glasses off because they are disgusting. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I turned 40, I, uh, I had fantastic vision always, ever. I didn't have any problems. And when I turned 40, my eye says, yeah, whatever, thank you, we're leaving. Uh, we're on holiday, just, just here's the thing, just do your thing. And I needed glasses. And uh, when, I, when I finally bought glasses, I think, oh, wait, hang on. I really understood typography so much better once I had glasses. Like, ah, that's what they're talking about. So if you want a good book designed, an interior of a good book or a magazine or a newspaper or find somebody over 40, it's not that they know more about typography, it's that, that they can see and tell you that they cannot read it anymore. Uh, and it will make you a better topographer. If you are under 40 and already going for glasses, go for it.
first then I was 50 and my, my optician said, so shall we make an appointment for the reading glasses? And I'm going, ah, silly person, of course, not reading glasses. And a, a month later, I was there uh, getting, getting reading glasses. Um, there's no message in that. That was a joke, but now, fine. Uh, fifth subject, we're rapidly going through this. We can make this design spaces. Um, there's a bit of math in here and a bit of logic, and uh, I'm going to say variable fonts. Uh, imagine a space, uh, an abstract space that contains all of your ideas, and it's infinite in all directions. Uh, maybe uh, this is similar to Plato's no sphere, where you know everything you could possibly think of and, and everything anybody can think of has a point in that space. Something like that uh, uh, abstract space is now part of uh, uh, OpenType. We can, we can sort of build these fonts. There's a particular kind of math involved, um, but we can think of these spaces as infinite in all directions. It's like interpolations. You, you put one thing in one place, you put another thing in another place, and then somehow magically the stuff in the middle uh, uh, comes, comes into existence. Of course, it's not infinite. You put one thing in there, it doesn't go beyond that, and the stuff in the middle might not be so good. But it's an interesting way to think of a shape. We no longer make a single shape. Uh, you make a, a mathematical process that can create any number of shapes, and you kind of determine what the bandwidth is. Um, so how do you, and how do you sketch for this? How do you design for this? Uh, I cannot have a talk uh, without showing this slide, or um, uh, one slide of uh, my uh, teacher, Gerrit Noortzijn. Um, it was a teacher at the academy at, uh, um, in 1961 and 1990, and I was in his class one of the last years. Um, this diagram on the left is something he drew in 1973, and I think this is the oldest uh, um, drawing, that at least that he made, as, as a proposal of how you could think about type. So if you, if you take these two black ones in the middle, there's, a, there's a, an expansion pointed pen thing, and there's a broad nib, sort of a broad nibby thing. This is not entirely broad nib, but you know what I mean. Um, as a start, and he actually calls it start, and he says, a reduction of contrast. There's an arrow and there's a direction. The thins become thicker, and the thins become thicker. These are two separate processes, but it's the same process on two different models. This becomes something like Gill, this becomes something like Helvetica. Um, and then there's the opposite, an increase of contrast, where the thicks become thicker, and I think uh, he, he fudges the, the thins a little bit, but the thicks become thicker, and you get a weird display, Baskerville kind of a, a photo lettering thing, and you get sort of a fat face Bodoni. Uh, what he illustrates here is really um, um, a math, and it's not a mathematical model, he's really uh, illustrating an idea. Um, he suggests that there are dimensions of freedom that we can use to, to think about type. Um, when he drew this, I did a, I have a presentation about this and I already did it four times and everybody is sick of it and I'm also sick of it, but it's a really nice talk at some point. I'm sure you'll find it somewhere. Um, this, this cube um, then is, is the diagram from earlier, but uh, that one is in the middle and it's sort of like a five of five front and then there's four layers behind it. Um, not everybody sees it as a cube, but they see it as a hexagon. Who sees it as a cube? Cube? Team cube? Oh, wow. Team cube is not... Come on, who, who sees it as team tile, team hexagon? No interaction, I'm sorry, oh, this will be over soon. <laughs> but I think you know, this, this was an interesting way to, he shows that you can think about type not just as a single shape or as a, as a result of a calligraphic process, it's really something that, uh, these are parameters that you can pick up and change and, and, and even if you don't follow this particular model, just the fact that type is ruled by parameters that are there for, for the designer to, to play with. Um, for our uh, little type cooker exercise machine, typecooker.com, free, free recipes. There's a little JavaScript that just draws. Uh, it has a little word list and it makes you a little list to, uh, to, uh, to draw and sketch. It's a little sketching machine. Uh, there's about 20 more parameters, not just uh, uh, increase and decrease of contrast. So I knew that image uh, for years. Uh, I showed it to my students and then I thought, well, maybe it's time to actually uh, make something. So last, last autumn, uh, I made a drawbot script and actually interpolated all 125 uh, E's and soldered them together. Uh, these are, how many counters? If I, if I have 125 E's and there's two counters on each E, how many shapes do you have here? Uh, a lot, thank you. Uh, this is uh, our wonderful uh, letter carving teacher, Frans Meisel uh, with with the final cube, and this is the thing on my desk. Uh, just 
just to see that you know, I've now I have a very expensive desk ornament. Um, but as an object, it is, it is really interesting because when Nordstein made this, when he thought about this, it was just a, a, a mental model to think about changes in contrast. But with uh, variable fonts, it is now basically an eight master, three dimensional uh, uh, working typeface. You can actually build this as a typeface. And the interesting thing is that I hadn't really thought about it, but just making the thing so you can see it and look at it uh, made me realize that you only see half of the letters. So, so in Nortide's image, uh, this one, uh, I think you see 61 of them and a 64 that's hidden behind them. And the 64 that are hidden are really boring. They're, they're sort of, like the stuff that's in the middle there is, is stuff that, that is ruled by eight masters at the same time. So it's not really this, not really that, not really this, not really that. And they're interpolations of all sorts of ideas. And it's, it's basically the typographic equivalent of beige. It's, it's all of the colors together, and it's no longer interesting. And it looks remarkably like that uh, typeface of the 90s that everybody loves, the Helvetica of the 90s. I'm not telling you, no. It's meta, of course, meta. Um, so how do we teach, how do we teach, how do we figure this out, how do I figure this out? I made a little uh, a toy uh, called Responsive Lettering, which is on GitHub. Uh, and then I do this as an exercise with my students. This is the work by Ryan Buckton, who graduated yesterday. Um, it's a shape that animates. Uh, and it's sort of similar to, to some of the things, uh, some of the Rotterdam, uh, the, the, but a very, very brutally basic version of it. So it animates, and then it can also respond to the rectangle it's in. If, if you're drawing logos, and if you're drawing shapes, if you're making any kind of graphic, it's no longer a particular size. It's no longer a particular rectangle. You really want this to fit at any rectangle uh, that we're looking at, because we're all looking at the same data, but one of them is here, and one of them is there, and one of them is on the wall, and all of these rectangles are different. And even if we put our phones on the table, the pixel sizes of those screens are all different. So you cannot design for it. You cannot anticipate it. So we need to make things that have uh, sort of a variety, a range of widths and weights to fit. And of course, that also means that as a designer, you need to decide it's not going to get any wider than this. This is fine. Uh, this is uh, a responsive lettering project by Tuck Media student Anja Danilova, um, in which uh, the, sh the shapes are very simple, but then uh, the counters turn into the shape and the shape turns into the counters, which I think is fantastic. Um, these, these are not big design projects that take months. I mean, this stuff is, is done relatively quickly, just as a, as a method of sketching, just to, to get familiar with it. Um, here's a thing by Daniel Grumer. Uh, it says Ahalan. Uh, it's Hebrew that then animates into uh, Arabic. And this actually did, did take him more than a day. This, uh, he actually um, did, did fantastic work. This shows that it's not just an interpolation. It's not just you have one extreme and you have the other extreme, and then the math will do the stuff in the middle. As a designer, you're responsible for what that math does. It's not just you're, you're making a thing. You're, it's, it's, uh, you're a choreographer, you're, you're an animator. You have to make sure that the stuff in the middle makes sense. So the way that the Hamza at the, the top right then turns into the top right stroke and it sort of folds, or that the way that the curls open and the way there's a rotation happening, I think it's, you know, it's simple, but it's also quite complex. And um, it's lovely to see this work. And then last year, uh, Jen Ramirez uh, um, uh, made this one, which is like super complicated and I can double colors and, um, I tell them this, when in doubt, draw. If you don't know what to do, if, if technology is, is getting you down, just draw. Um, this one uh, is one I made as a very early uh, example. Uh, and funny enough, uh, this one is used in a bunch of early articles on variable fonts um, to show what you could do with variable fonts. And of course, it's really funny because it's not a variable font, it's an animated SVG. And to, <laughs> to actually do this in a variable font, uh, because uh, the very subtle thing it's doing is that the outside bounds, bounds of the P to the outside bounds of the ampersand, it stays within its rectangle very, very nicely. <laughs> and you cannot actually do that with uh, variable fonts because the math would be, would be crazy. So um, variable fonts may have been over-advertised a little bit too much. Um, but you know, it's, it's peace. Um, yeah, so this is stuff that I then end up doing. This was a research uh, I had a little demo font. I wanted to experiment with variable fonts. I got into the format. I got into defining variable font, uh, sorry, uh, design spaces, and I wrote code for this, and this went into other tools. And 
once you start writing tools, uh, it's a nice experience because you discover, I discovered that you know, it's incredibly powerful and you can, you can change the way that you work in, in very profound ways. Uh, at the same time, it's also very frustrating because it's just a new rabbit hole you go into. And um, does it move? It does move. Look at that. So this is a, a, a plugin called Skateboard. It's a little plugin for, for Robofont. And it is to, it's, it's like a visualizer, uh, a navigation tool for these design spaces where uh, uh, the spaces can be very complex, can, can have dozens of, of masters and uh, do all sorts of weird things. I started doing this because I discovered that it is actually quite difficult, and uh, this may be a problem, uh, to draw uh, an S uh, as a variable font. I, I think we don't want to have variable fonts with the letter S, then we should solve this. Um, I think I have a solution for it, but uh, there's something about the, the way that, that uh, the math works and that the curves work and that how, how Euclid works in this universe, uh, we're, we're kind of screwed. Um, to have nice S's in the middle uh, when the angles changes and the width changes, there's, there's stuff. So I discovered after a year of fussing around that I could not solve it. Mathematically, it's a problem and, and it's, it's just going to do that thing. The only way you could actually solve it is by building a tool where I realized, okay, well, it, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a compromise. Uh, I need to make this compromise and as a designer, I make lots of compromises all the time. Then at least I need to be informed. I need to see what that compromise is. And uh, these previews at least will help me to show, to show the result in all the gory details. But then, you know, it's like a year's work. Is it worth it? I don't know. I know how to draw S's now, which is good. Didn't know how to do that. So all of that, you know, education and math and technology and tools and history and, and experience and fun and colleagues, all of that stuff will only get you to the starting line history um, is not there to be mined, right? We're designers. Occasionally we need to come up with new things. And I'd like to say that these ideas come quick and thick, uh, but I also notice that most of my ideas are just garbage. Uh, most of my thoughts are garbage and I've grown used to it and I just let my mind do its thing and I write down everything and then I make my drawings and uh, uh, sometimes there is a nice thing in there, but it takes time to explore these directions and uh, to figure out new shapes. So what did I start doing? Um, I, st I just started drawing. Uh, about last year, I got an electronic uh, drawing device and started sketching and started figuring stuff out. You would call it lettering, except it does not look like a happy toothpaste-y uh, happy thing. Uh, for Instagram, I think most of them actually end up being rather brutal. Uh, it's got low contrast, it's sharp, it's unclean. I don't digitize it, I don't make fonts out of it, uh, but I'm, havi I'm having a hell of a time and I'm actually figuring out how this drawing works in a, in a digital environment. Uh, some of these things will resemble book covers. Um, I'm not gonna lie and say that yes, of course I'm fishing for work because I also have to feed hungry Muppets, but at the same time, you know, it, it's not a portfolio. And uh, really, this is experiments in contrast and style. And so just to get uh, off on the right foot, uh, this is me drawing a skull. Uh, I guess I was feeling, you know, outward going, friendly, communic communicative, and remember we're all dying. Uh, this was, um, this was a uh, uh, 2018, 2018 thing. Uh, there's a, a really nice quote from, uh, from Ruskin, um, otherwise a pretty bonkers person, uh, but it's something is you should mistrust anything that you can make with a lot of patience and sandpaper, uh, which, which I think is, is, is very painfully close to type design. Uh, so if you spend hours and hours and hours drawing the fur on these letters, it does not make them better letters. It makes them just more furry. Um, <laughs> And then, of course, you know, these tablets allow you to, to, to then record it and then they say, look at me making beautiful letters and uh, you don't want to see this. A uh, small typeface project for Dan, uh, Dan for Peter Verhul for the Dutch alphabets book. That was fun. I drew it, I digitized it, I set these words with it and I threw it away. It does not need to be a font, it does not need to be a product, you don't need to buy it. Uh, just making the shapes I thought was nice. And then that idea of these really skinny, 
high contrast, uh, 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 Sanji things got me into this. Uh, again, you know, it's not a book, uh, but who, who could complain about Orwell? And just uh, discovering that I could make a W out of three, three pins, or to make an R. I think this is an exercise, you know, in uh, how much stuff can I get away? And this is a pretty old one. Uh, then I thought, if, if this isn't working, I can always open up a bar, and I will call it the Font and Math Alehouse. <laughs> and this will be the sign. Um, then maybe a restaurant as well, which will be called the Scalable Fish. If you, if you, if you know your type history, uh, the GX format uh, in 1992 was called Royal Bass. Royal Bass, because some Apple engineer liked fishing. And the fish is scalable, and the type is scalable. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so um, I needed to tell myself this, uh, allow this to happen, um, to draw things with an open end, to know that it's not going to be a typeface. And you know, the whole commercial thing is gone, but I need to explore what these shapes are and what they, what they could be uh, and not always show it. Can we please do ornaments again? Because I love this. This is E and A, that ampersand is, is fantastic. The A is my wife. Uh, the dots are just, I, I just uh, think this is, uh, this is good stuff. Uh, this is the, uh, the third and lesser known book uh, from uh, um, Isaac Newton. Uh, so you, you know the optics and light in the Principia Mathematica. He also wrote the Principia Artis Magicis. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's just a pretty book cover. Um, this is you know, how these shapes relate to a limited space, how close they can be to the edge or what, what tension they could be. I was thinking if there's a love story between R2-D2 and C-3PO, this would be it. And then, of course, there's a little face there. Also, how many USB ports would, would C-3PO have? Uh, then uh, I got into the Star Wars thing, uh, Vader and the Wookiee. Uh, there was a photograph of the two actors of, uh, um, of course, I don't know their names, but uh, Darth Vader and uh, Chewbacca, and nobody knew them, know their faces, but you know their work. And it would be nice to have a book about them. Um, these are two uh, designer guides I need to write someday, uh, keeping custom workhorses uh, and raising retail fonts. Um, everybody likes a workhorse, nobody knows what it is, so this, this book uh, will, will tell you. This also shows that uh, for at that time I, I was looking at Bertolt Wolff's work way too much, and I was not getting anywhere near it, but bloody hell, does he know how to draw. Uh, this is also uh, a lovely pseudo Wolpian. Um, I noticed that my mind can look at these things two ways. I can admiringly look at this beautiful piece of lettering that I did, and then it snaps, and then I see all of the stupid things that I did. And I think as long as it sort of flips between these two, it's fine. Uh, this, this is a word that says ass, and you know, uh, I, I had the, the drawing tablet with me, and I had most of the document, no, most of the screen was used by an uh, academic policy thing, I was in a meeting and that was really boring, but there has a small narrow strip to the side of the window, there was the second screen, that's where the drawing program was, and that was just the same proportions as the letter A. So I was drawing the A and then I moved it around and then drawing the S. Uh, so this is, this is my opinion of a particular meeting I was in, but I, know, I love doing this. Um, peripheral yeah, stuff upside down, there's more, more drawings. I see these things and I think, what a sloppy, what a sloppy nonsense. I, I cannot admire uh, any of it. I also show it with, uh, with some, some hesitation because it's kind of intimate to show how you draw and maybe, uh, maybe this should not be posted. Uh, but then why is that? It's, it's kind of funny. So uh, this is gonna be my second bar. It will be the, the, the shapes and spaces bar, beer, beer bar. There was that thing sort of in fullness and there was this. And anyway. More books. Uh, this is on my phone. I love this. Also, pseudo Wolpian, um, a book on bean soup, I suppose. Uh, this is an actual cover, and I sold the architecture of it a little bit. This is Ghastly Good Taste, The Rise and Fall of English Architecture by John Betjeman, which is hilarious. Um, just the depressing story of the rise and fall of English architecture. If you, if you know how to get this book, the, the cover is actually much, much nicer than this. Um, I think in summary, um, or all of this stuff really is vacuous frippery. It, it never assumed that these things have any meaning. Uh, once you start getting into the, the, the squishy, scratchy, 
you know, stylistic exercises. There's unfortunately no clients, there's no work, there's no um, value to society. I mean, it keeps me off the street, I suppose. Um, but I learn from it and it brings me uh, a lot of enjoyment, especially that, that E at the bottom and that Y. Uh, but most of it maybe should be summarized as this. And um, that brings me to the last slide. I, I thank you very much for your patience and uh, your resistance to the heat. Uh, uh, thank you, Jean-Francois, for this invitation and this evening. And uh, thank you all for staying awake. Staying awake. Thank you. asked me uh, last week uh, what kind of talk you can do here. Yeah, you pretty, you, shall, you shall have I done do exactly what I... Shall I do this talk? Yeah. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, back to the first slide then. Okay. <laughs> okay, where is the button? It's it only 20 minutes. Hey, that was okay. It was okay, right? It was, it was okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a lot of... Okay, so, so the talk number ti uh, 10 of, of the summer, you maybe have some question. You know, I, I, I on the side news, there is these uh, TP Talks 19, but Twitter is down, but most of you using Instagram, so there is few minutes left to post some stuff. Uh, but you have question. I'm sure you have question. I hope you have question. If, if, you, if you point uh, your so mobile devices to type media org slash TM 1819 yeah. responsive, you will see all of the responsive things that the type media students made this year. So if you have question about, about pizza, the pizza on the back. Yeah. But so I give the answer. So like that, we can move on on a question for Eric. Yes, I have one here. Um, hello. hello. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what advice could you give to someone who wants to change the way he draws, his drawing uh, attitude, uh, his drawing uh, costumes, and get into something different like the experiments that you showed at the end, how this idea came from. It's just you started making a sketch and then it became just a whole style, or is there any, any other influence? Uh, just changing the method. Uh, get, get out of your vector editor, get out of your font editor. Uh, those are fine if you want to make fonts or sharp images, but they are near impossible to experiment with shapes. The, w the motion that your hand can make, if you hold a pen or a stylus, and I, I hate to say this because it, it sort of looks like it's the, the threshold to getting into design is getting bigger and bigger and more expensive, but um, I'm, I'm totally and blindly in love with the new Apple tablet because that pen is just absolutely fantastic. It is, I'm, I'm sorry, it's like sounding like an unpaid Joni Ive uh, um, fanboy. Um, but those things, or any kind of paint, any kind of ink, any kind of where you make strokes and you, you draw, it does not need to be calligraphy. It doesn't need to be formal, but anything where you can make a shape and, and, and cut away things. I think so, most of the stuff I'm, I'm discovering here is uh, with one motion you can paint and with the same motion, the same tool and the same texture, you can remove it again. So you can have a really sharp razor and that, that brings all of these stencily things are, are coming from there. Uh, where the, the process of making the shape is not just an additive where you add with a marker and then you use clumsy whiteout to remove it again. You, you can actually t draw with the same sharpness in both directions. Um, changing scale is a good thing. If you are used to making work on really, really small things, just you know, get a wall somewhere and make, make big things. Um, very, very basic, easy. Get a blackboard in your office uh, or your house. Uh, and experiment, uh, draw. Uh, if, you, if you don't have any ideas, draw stuff that other people drew and see if you understand how those shapes work. You know, uh, Bertolt Wolfe or Rudolf Koch or, or even you know, Frudiger or, or Zapf if you want to go nuts. I wouldn't draw Zapf personally, but you know, some people like it. Um, don't do things that you see on Instagram that are called lettering because they're always the same sweet fuzzy, flowery things. And it does not need to be that way. It can be hard or aggressive. The, the, the thing with lettering is it the only means that the letters have to exist in that order. So this letter follows that order and the shape can respond to it. it does, it's not a style, it's not a visual thing. You can make anything. 
And with that in mind, uh, just draw, build up your your ideas, your your peculiar interests. You really like condensed things. You really like sharp things. You really want to try out really horizontal, super scale, fast, italic things. I mean, go for it. There's no client for it. Uh, it's open ended, uh, and and I think as as part of a, a, a an artistic or as, as a development of a of a desi designer, I think it's really important to have those those things. And I noticed that code isn't doing it for me uh, anymore. It, it has its place, but it, it does not make shapes. It does not make new things. And I need to draw. Might be different for you, but that's how it works for me. Thank you. Question? No question tonight? You will not get some pizza, I say. <laughs> I will, I will check everyone who has a question. They have the pizza first. Pizza are good? Yeah. Thank um, you very much. No, no, doesn't say thank you very much yet. You, you, <coughs> you, uh, wha when you, when you design typeface, no, no. <laughs> good answer. Uh, there is a big, uh, big discussion about uh, designing typeface um, as a team, because you 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 speak about a very large project with you know mutator and things like that. There is some specialization into typeface design. Some people doing certain things, and other. Oh, oh, what is your point of view about that? I think with any creative discipline, uh, they exist in a very small, very intimate, personal research of how to make an idea or to discover new things or experiment. And at the same time, there's the, the, the commercial reality of having to produce big things uh, with lots of requirements. So y yes, there are projects where you need uh, uh, two or three people working on the Latin and you need somebody for the Cyrillic and you need definitely two people for the, for the Arabic and you need like two or three people for the, for the Index. Uh, and you need, you need a whole company for the, for the kanji and the, uh, the CJK. So those, those projects can be huge, but they can also be scaled back. I think once, once you sort of know what, what the direction is, what the um, applications are, what the, what the outside requirements are, um, uh, these, these things can be scaled up very quickly. And, it, and then it helps to, to know, to have a network and to know people who can solve particular things. I think a really nice example is uh, the project that my colleague, uh, friend Paul van der Laan did with this Bold Monday company for uh, mm -hmm. IBM. It's a typeface called IBM Flex, uh, which became an open source thing, and it has all sorts of scripts, uh, uh, Arabic, uh, uh, Indic, uh, Cyrillic, um, huge character set, but th they made it as a huge team. They, they, a lot of people worked on that, and there was a lot of management and, and getting stuff done. So initially, the kernel of, of what the style is going to be, I think that, that has to be a smaller group, or maybe just individuals, but then expanding that and building on that, uh, those, are, those can be huge projects. Do you, uh, when you are type media, does the people who are the, the 12, 11 students for one year, <coughs> do, do you teach them how to work together? Because it seems that, you know, when we see the project uh, going out on the internet after a few months on their website, you have the project of Bernard and John, and so everything is separate, but... Um, it, it would be nice to actually have a, a more of a collective uh, a group project in there. The, the problem there is that the, the course is quite short. It's a single year. And then to... Short, one year. Oh, it's one year. I think, how, how long did it take you to fully understand spacing? Five weeks. Huh? Five weeks? <laughs> All right. No, no, please continue. Please. No. Um, so, to... Just, just for an educational thing, you need to be able to judge what people did. If you want to give them an individual degree, they need to do an individual project. Uh, there are things that they do collectively, and they certainly help each other out, and they, they uh, uh, support each other. Um, a couple of years ago, I tried, as a small experiment, to have a project in Git, and then introduce type design students to Git. Uh, that didn't work very well. Um, introducing people who code to Git already is an issue, and, and I know that's uh, that's, a, that's a thing. So there's, there's all sorts of ways that we can improve on that, working together, but 
basically just sitting down with people, talking, having a, having a discussion, what are we working on, what's going to happen, all that is fine, then you can do really, really big things. Last question. It says pizza, a pizza question. Pizza question. Mm. Um, so thank you very much, Eric.